Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. What a wonderful Sabbath so far. Thank you to our music team. Thank you for... Uh, the adventurers who have been helping us out all service. Uh, just really quick, just if there's any leaders here at church, can we just give them a quick round of applause? The leaders work so hard in this ministry. We just really appreciate their reaching out to our young people. It's, a, it's an important ministry, and we thank you so much for it. And of course, uh, the scripture reading and all the wonderful things we've experienced so far. Welcome to you all at Seventh-day Adventist Church, whether you are in person or live streaming. We're so glad that you're here. We are in the last part of our series on being offended, called the snare of Satan. So if you have not had a chance to be offended yet in the series, this is your last chance. And I'm going to try as hard as I can <laughs> to work you up a little bit. So the first series, first part of the series, we talked about don't take the bait. And you remember, if you were paying attention, what does it mean not to take the bait? Don't get offended. We talked about how when you read through scripture, when it talks about stumbling blocks, when it talks about being offended, being offended is never a sign of spiritual maturity in scripture. And yet the devil wants to bait us into thinking it is. And so we get offended, we get worked up, and we mess up our relationships, and we think we're doing the Lord's work, and really we're just causing a mess. The second sermon Pastor Mike preached was called Trapped. When you do a study of the Greek and you look at the word stumbling block, or the word that we sometimes translate offended, it literally means to snare an animal. It's not, it's not an experience that we're supposed to have. We don't want to be snared. We don't want to be trapped. The scripture reading that we're going to read again real shortly talks about we want to be set free from the traps and the snares that are set before us. And then a couple weeks ago, we talked about prison break. When we do take the bait, when we do get offended, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs that it's like a brother offended is like a fortified city. It's like we build walls up. We, we shut ourselves off from everybody, and we get kind of in this stuck place. And it also goes on to say that quarreling is like the bars of a castle. We just get separate and we get stuck in our offense. And that's not the way we want to do it. We want to be able to communicate well as opposed to saying I'm offended or that's offensive. We want to be able to say things like I'm hurt or I'm confused or I'm sad or I'm angry and give the other person a chance to release us from that experience of being offended. Because ultimately, we're called to be connected, not disconnected. That's, that's bottom line. So this week, we're going to talk about releasing others. One of the questions that's come up in this series is, this, is there never a time just to let somebody go? Is there never a time just to separate a relationship? Well, yes, there is. But the other thing, too, is we want to also be assets to the kingdom of God, and we want to release other people. We certainly want to be released from our own offense, but what can we do to help other people get out of that experience? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we get into the message, I want to invite you to stand, and we're going to reread that scripture that Jerry and read. Right. You've been waiting for it. You've been sitting down too long. You need to get up, move a little bit. And when we read the Word of God, we want to do it with, with some boldness, with some feeling. And when it gets to the word foolish and stupid, I want you to put a little bit of emphasis, if you can. I want you to really just savor those words. So we're going to read this. This is a letter from Paul to his young protege, Timothy, a young pastor, and he's giving him some good sage advice that all of us need. Let's read together. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you you know they produce quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them care captive to do his will. Perfect. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for gathering us all here together. And Lord, we want to acknowledge that in life we pick up cuts and bruises and stings, and sometimes it's a hard thing not to be bitter and resentful and offended. But ultimately, you have called us to be connected to you and to each other. You've called us to a life of peace and kindness and gentleness, not being disgruntled and angry and frustrated. Jesus, whatever angst that we are carrying today, I pray somehow by your spirit that you release us of that. Help us to listen to the word today. Help us to have this, this moment before the week starts, this Sabbath moment of rest and peace to just bask in the presence of you and our brothers and sisters in Christ and to hear your word this morning. Jesus, may this not be abstract theology. May this be very practical information and revelation that we can internalize and practice so we can grow your kingdom. Jesus, guard our hearts and minds from every distraction. Don't let the baggage that we have brought in here this morning affect us and how you would have us hear your word. 
Jesus, we love you and we thank you for the victory from releasing us from an experience of being offended and giving us the strength to release others. In your precious name we pray and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. A few years ago, I took out a local pastor to Starbucks because after observing him, I felt that his behavior was rather odd. He was happy. Really happy. I met him at an interdenominational prayer breakfast that happens in town that Mike and I attended off and on for a while. He was in his late 50s, early 60s, and he just projected this effervescent joy everywhere he went. He'd bounce around, he was smiling and laughing, and I began to be concerned for his mental health. <laughs> because most pastors that I know who make it to their late 50s, early 60s in pastoring do not project joy. They project, just get me out of here. Just get me to retirement. So it was, a, it was an interesting thing to see. So I just said, let's go out and let me just, just sort of ask you some questions. We sat down together at this place. He had his drink, and I, I thought about just asking, what's wrong with you? But I thought that, that might not be a good way to start. So I said, can you explain to me how, why are you so happy after years of ministry? And he said, I'll tell you. The first 13 years of my current church were absolute hell on earth, but the last three years have been wonderful. So now I'm really concerned for this person. 13 years? You spent 13 years in a toxic community, in a toxic, dysfunctional situation. 13 years. I began to wonder if he had some sort of Stockholm Syndrome. You know, when people fall in love with, with those who capture them and hold them hostage. You know, I thought about reaching across the table and taking this and saying, hey man, it's okay. It's okay. Do you need help? We can get you out of here. You don't have to stay there. But he said, no, 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 no. That's not what it is. I mean, but, it, but it blew my mind because most of us... It doesn't take 13 years. When stuff starts happening and we get angry, we're angry, we start looking for the way out. We look for the detour. We look for the escape hatch from hell or the loophole from the life that we're living to get away from those people who are offending and ruining things for us. How did you do this? How did you stay journeying with a group of people who, by your account, seem to be pretty dysfunctional? I said, I'll tell you how. And he mentioned a book called The Bait of Satan. Now in its 20th anniversary edition. This book deals with the subject of how to live above the experience of being offended. How to live above being offended and how to help release other people from that experience of being offended. It talks about how do you stick with people when they aren't doing so well. How do you, how do you structure your life so the poison that is in their soul doesn't get into your own. He said, this book absolutely changed my life. And this is the book that helped inspire the series that we're concluding this morning. It's an important topic. It's, it's a relevant topic because the world is increasingly angry and offended, in case you haven't noticed. And we need to understand as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, how do I not become affected by this experience of offense and how do I help other people so they don't get stuck there either? If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to 2 Timothy, that little letter, little section we just read, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and starting in verse 23. I actually want to back it up to verse 22, because I caught something this morning as I was studying and praying over the sermon. 2 Timothy, turn, tap, scroll, make a friend if you didn't bring anything. Again, Paul is writing to his young protege, giving this young pastor some advice, knowing that he's going to encounter all kinds of things while he's working for Jesus. And here's how it starts in verse 22. Flee youthful passions. And that's important to, to note right there. Again, this is not an insult for youth. This is not what we're doing up here. We just had a wonderful youth Sabbath last weekend. We're not going to start ripping on the youth. That's not what it's saying. It's recognizing that there are certain things that are immature that you need to get rid of if you're going to mature and be a follower of Jesus. Flee immature passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So what it's telling you is what we're about to read starting in verse 23. This is immature behavior for a follower of Jesus. Have nothing to do with foolish and ignorant and stupid controversies and arguments. You know that they breed quarrels. First thing we have to acknowledge the Bible reveals that there is such a thing as a stupid argument. They exist. And apparently there's a lot of them, otherwise there wouldn't be a warning in there for us to avoid getting into one. 
They happen all the time. I talked to a colleague of mine last week and he said, not too long ago, maybe a year or two ago, he was leading worship and he was playing guitar, nothing wild, just strumming along accompaniment. And someone came up to him and said, I am offended, and I quote, by the way you're strumming your guitar. How do you even respond to that? What, do you, what are you supposed to say to something like that? Listen very closely. Most of what people get offended at isn't ethical or legal. Most of what we get so worked up over and so offended over isn't a legal issue, it isn't an ethical issue, and rarely is it even a biblical issue. Most of the time, we don't get offended by human trafficking, homelessness, cheating, bullying, or hypocrisy. We get offended over worship formats, carpet colors, how the sermon went past noon, and how things people say online that we don't even know, and the potluck food, and I can't believe the pastor's not wearing a tie. And when I got here this morning, the little chocolate dish at the Welcome Center, they ran out, so I didn't get a piece. Now I'm going to give someone a piece of my mind. <laughs> That's what we get worked up over. Sometimes I am amazed that people even make it to church to get offended. How did you even survive your week? <laughs> if that's what sets you off. It's unbelievable. One of the, the most memorable chapels I had, I only remember one or two chapels from my experience at Union College, which was a while ago, was one of the Tuskegee Airmen, an African-American squadron of pilots that served in World War II. One of the pilots, he gave it, it, was, it, was, it stuck with me in this chapel talk. He said, before the war, you, the, the racism was palpable, the insults, the slights, the, the you name it happened. But as soon as the war started and we were fighting alongside each other, it all vanished. Amen. But when the war ended, it picked up again. Too often... We are not fighting the right battle, so we end up fighting each other. Most of the time when we get worked over, up over that stuff, we are fighting the wrong battles in life. When you're fighting the wrong battles in life, you're not fighting the real major battles. We turn on each other and start fighting. Catch this, church. Most of what we argue over is not sin. But we argue over it long enough to get angry enough to start sinning. Most of what we argue over, we quarrel over things that are not sin. We quarrel over things that are not sin until we sin. I have news for you. According to this passage, catch this, we are not called to participate in or win every argument that comes along. We are not called to argue over every minor imperfection in this world, this side of heaven. If Jesus had argued over every minor imperfection he saw, he never would have accomplished his mission. Let the Spirit just drop that into your heart this morning. Let it just sit there for a minute. You are not responsible to participate in and win every argument you come across. Think how much free time you have now. <laughs> you can actually get back to the things you're supposed to be doing. You know, we might have time to pick up a musical instrument or read a book or write a book about how wonderful it is not to be arguing with everybody. You don't have to buy a new appliance to get energy savings. Just stop arguing with everybody about everything. And your quality of life will increase. Another liberating and irritating truth that this verse brings out because it's telling us that there is, you know, the proverb says don't argue with the fool. This verse acknowledges there are silly, goofy arguments not to participate in. There are arguments that you will never win. Here's something I want you to just get a hold of right now. You cannot control people. That's a liberating and frustrating truth. You cannot control anybody. And that's a shame. Because I'm sure not a few of us have some people that we have some recommendations for their behavior. <laughs> there's a few of you at home who have honey-do lists. I'm pretty sure out there that somewhere there's honey-don't lists too. I'm pretty sure that there's people in here who, have, who somewhere have written down ideas that they have about the way other people should need to behave. You may have even published something online about how you think your spouse or your child or your boss or your pastor, maybe even the president should be behaving. <laughs> Ultimately, you cannot control anybody. 
ultimately, we can't make people unoffended. In reality, we can't make people offended either. That's a choice someone has to make. We can encourage and we can resource and we can empathize, but we cannot, including pastors, you cannot micromanage someone's spiritual meltdown. At some point, they have to take that crisis to Christ Amen. and get the healing they need. And we can encourage them, we can pray for them, but ultimately, they've got to make that decision. Control is not what we are called to, which brings up one of the warning signs that you need to release someone from your life. Sometimes the experience of being offended is used to manipulate and control other people. In other words, I am offended, and if you don't fill in the blank, I'm going to misbehave, I'm going to create a scene, and I'm going to leave. A colleague of mine shared a story with me last week about a brother in his church who every single week it was his, it was his ministry to point out what the latest unpardonable sin was that he committed which is usually what happens with people who get offended very easily. They sort of believe they have the gift of discernment. They can see everybody else's sins. And so he said, here's what happened. He goes, I was scheduled to teach the adult Sabbath school in the sanctuary. But there was something wrong. My colleague had the audacity to teach the Sabbath school lesson without a suit coat. Mm. So before class started, this brother said, I need to see you in the vestry. They went to the vestry with the door open so everybody could hear. He said, if you don't go back in there and apologize and repent and make this right, then I am taking my books and I am leaving. The man ended up leaving early that day. And what was really sad about it is it was communion Sabbath. The time when we remember all the horrific things that Jesus went through just so we could have a relationship. And he calls us to make those same sacrifices so we can have a relationship with each other. That's the day you're going to leave. That's the day you're going to get offended and walk away. Ellen White says, one of my favorite quotes that Ellen White says, she goes... Force, not four. <laughs> force is the last resort of every false religion. And when someone shows up and says, if you don't do this, and again, we're not talking about an ethical or a sinful kind of thing. We're talking about personal preference and tradition. If someone walks up to you and says, if you don't do this, then I'm going to do this. That is not the spirit of Jesus. That is a manipulation tactic trying to force you to do what somebody else wants. I believe in dialogue, and I even believe in disagreeing. Here's a revolutionary thought. I believe you can disagree with your spouse and your children and your pastor and your committee and still be brothers and sisters in Christ and still journey together. But if someone is going to use offense over an issue of personal preference to try to twist my arm to acquiesce, I'm going to hold the door open. When you build a building like this one, the fire code says you need to have so many exits in case the building catches on fire so people will get trapped in and die. <laughs> a lot of us have built a life that has not enough exits. We will allow people into our life to light, they will light our life on fire with spiritual immaturity and rage and we won't let them go. Now, on the flip side, some of you have too many exits and you let people go <laughs> way too quickly. <laughs> we'll get to that. But for right now, there comes a moment with people where you may need to release them. I have a counselor friend of mine, and he told me candidly one day, don't block the exit for crazy. If it's going to go, there, there are times I, people have tried to manipulate me, and I, I said, that's fine, you are more than welcome to go. As a matter of fact, I'll write you a recommendation letter to the one place that you want to go and leave from here. And depending on how much chaos someone is putting in my life, I might write a thank you card to the people who are taking them off my hands, or send a gift basket. Yeah. And there's a biblical precedent for this. If you go to Matthew 18, one of the least practiced verses in Scripture. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, we're starting in verse 15. This is a passage, this is Jesus talking, and Jesus is telling us how to deal with conflict. 
Jesus is telling us what to do. And if you read the whole passage of Matthew 18, it talks about stumbling blocks and being offended and trying to avoid the experience of being offended. And here's what Jesus says. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. That's the whole point is to reconnect. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile or a pagan or a tax collector, an outsider. The Apostle Paul picks up on this idea too. He wrote a letter to a church in Corinth that has all kinds of problems in there. And there was a guy who was just doing something gross. We're just going to leave it there. And here's what Paul says. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That gives a different nuance to deliverance ministries. Oh, you deliver people, f you deliver people from the devil. No, 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 no. No, we deliver people to the devil. We hand them right over, put a bow in their head and hand them over. Now, to be fair, if you read the second part, what is he saying? He's saying sometimes somebody needs to experience the natural consequences of their actions because nothing else is going to get through to them. And when they finally hit a wall and they hit rock bottom, they realize, this is an awful way to live my life. I need Jesus. I need to repent. I need to turn this thing around. And even the words of Jesus saying, treat somebody like a tax collector. What's interesting about that, that passage comes from the book of Matthew. Who wrote the book of Matthew? Don't think too hard about this. Who wrote the book of Matthew? <laughs> Matthew, the tax collector. <laughs> How did Jesus treat outsiders and tax collectors? Love. He loved them. He did everything he could to connect with them. So even when we have to come to a place to separate, it's not because we wish them ill and we want to punish them. It's because there's nothing more that we can do. We still love them and we pray for them and we care for them, but we release them. Sometimes we need to separate. If it's abusive, if it's illegal, if it's unbiblical, if it's unethical, and the person is unwavering in their commitment to self-destruction and destroying other people, then, catch this, then, like Jesus, we need to release them. Jesus does not force people to get well. And even though it breaks his heart, sometimes he has to let them go. But it doesn't mean we stop caring or praying for them. And we don't separate because we're offended. Too many people leave marriages and families and churches and work because I've been offended and we, and we leave. That is not a mature way to handle things. There are entire churches, this, this is scary, there are churches and ministries that have started because somebody was offended. There are churches, I've been in them, I know their history. There are churches that have been planted because somebody got offended. <laughs> There are ministries that have been started because a wealthy businessman or a doctor didn't get their way and so they launch off and do something else. There are pastors that launch other ministries because they, had, they thought they had some sort of Messiah complex. They, they thought they were a prophet. They had some important message and nobody listened to them. So they go stomping off and start their, their own ministry. And what's sad is then you start a ministry and it's got that DNA of angst and bitterness and offended and people who start following start picking that up. <laughs> I wish churches would be honest about some of their history. And there's churches I've been to, you know, sometimes churches in the lobby will have, you know, our church's history, and it talks about the, the pastors and the building and stuff, and it says, in 1974, so-and-so had a vision. No, 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 so-and-so got offended and got angry. Yeah. Had a little pity party. That's where your church came from, and the sooner you can acknowledge that and repent for it, you can be a lot healthier. <laughs> that is not how we're called to act. Now... There are times when we have done everything in our power. And we sense in our spirit, in our heart of hearts, God is releasing us to another church, another ministry, another relationship. There is a release in our spirits. We're not leaving in a huff. We're not leaving. There's a difference between leaving because you've done all you can do and God is releasing you to something else and leaving because you didn't get your way and you're going to make a big fit and have a temper tantrum and go storm off. Grow up. You don't want to leave with a spirit of bitterness. You want to leave and say, you know what? God has led me. I realize God wants me over here, and I wish these people well. I wish them God's blessing, but I sense God calling me over here. That is when, that's how you go. Then you're not carrying that garbage with you. And here's the other thing. If you read Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, before you bring your gift, whether it's a financial gift, whether it is a, a ministry gift, before you bring that to worship, and you know you've got a brother or a sister that you have, you're not reconciled with, you go fix that relationship before you bring your gift. Amen. Don't come in here expecting to connect and bless other people when you can't connect and bless the other, pe the other people God already put in your life. 
You don't want to give your gifts while you have a whole pile of bodies behind you that you haven't forgiven and you're bitter about and you haven't tried to reconcile. God is not going to bless that gift. Set the gift aside. Go make it right and then come and watch how God blesses. So that's what we do when we feel the need to release those people. But now how do we keep people? People we have a chance with. Let's go to the second part of our passage in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy verse 24. And the Lord's servant, if you're a servant of Jesus, it means you're not quarrelsome. But you are kind to everyone. You are able to teach. Patiently enduring evil. That means we don't have a knee-jerk reaction. It means we are patient. Correcting his opponents with what? Gentleness. Because we want God, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, that trap of being offended and disgruntled and bitter after being captured by him to do his will. People who are captured by a spirit of being offended, who are bitter and disgruntled, do a lot of damage. We want to set them free. We don't want to punish them. We don't want to hurt them. We want them out of that experience because it's a miserable place to be. We need to be gentle. We talked about, last time we were together, how the English language is built on metaphors, governing metaphors, and they're so embedded in our language we don't even see them. Now we get to arguments and we get to quarrels and disagreements. The metaphor that guides us is war. Argument is war. It has to be a winner and a loser. Even the proverb we looked at said, quarreling is like the bars of a castle. Get this into your spirit this morning. You are not going to fix a situation when somebody is offended by quarreling with them. You're not going to argue yourself out of that experience. It won't work. It's like the bars of a castle. Proverbs 15.1 says, a gentle answer, and you know this. If you've grown up in church, you know this passage. A gentle answer, what? Turns away wrath. Do you need more wrath in your life? I don't need any more. I have enough. <laughs> I need less. <laughs> A gentle answer turns away wrath. You are going to have to encounter this person who has been offended and has been separated and built these walls around themselves. They're doing it out of protection for themselves. They feel scared. They feel hurt. They don't feel good. And if, and if you approach that place with anger and arguments, it's not going to go well. You have to understand that when you are trying to get somebody out of that experience... Again, using the metaphor from the Bible, that little, we called it a pity, you had a pity party? This is a pity city. They've really walled themselves off. When you approach that fortress to try to breach the wall, they are going to attack you. You try to breach a city in a war kind of situation, they're going to fire arrows and missiles at you. You are going to get dinged and bruised and cut. But if you are the mature one, you will deal with it. You will put on the full armor of God and you will say, I am going to endure this. If Jesus can come down here and literally get nailed to a tree... I can put up with some nonsense for an hour or two. You need to be gentle. My friend JC, who's a chaplain over at Walla Walla, shared this story with me last week. She said, when I first started as a chaplain, one of the first people I had to visit was this guy, and I, I walked into the room, feeling pretty good, just out of college, wanting to help people. Goes into the room to pray and visit with him, and he says, first thing, I don't believe in women ministers her very existence and presence was offensive. She hadn't even said anything except good morning. Your very existence is offensive to me. And she said as, at the tender age of 23, I wanted to light my hair on fire and just run around the room screaming. <laughs> Which I thought would have been made for a really good story if she had done that, especially if it was the psych ward. That would have been a really, that could have gone really interesting. But instead, she held her cool and she said, tell me more about that. And there was a long pause, and he started to tell her his life story. A couple hours later, they prayed together, and he said, would you come visit me tomorrow? Amen. Turns out he was a Catholic priest who used to be an Adventist. What would have happened had she been offended and stormed out? Another seminary professor told me the story. He said when he was an intern pastor, he and the pastor had to go visit somebody who hadn't attended church for a year. And when they got to the place, they found out that the reason this person hadn't attended church for a year was because that same pastor, his senior pastor, during some church event, some social, he didn't remember what it was, had said, go get a chair. Meaning, you know, help us, we're setting this up, go get a chair. And he said, I was so offended because you bossed me around that I left. Now 
in that moment, yeah, let me show you something about a chair. Take it and smack you in the head. What's wrong with you? <laughs> or you know, abandon the community of faith because someone told you to get a chair. <laughs> Instead, the pastor just said, I'm so sorry. And the guy came back to church. Now, there are times you do things that legitimately hurt people and offend them, and you will have to sit in some very uncomfortable conversations. When I was an intern pastor, this is an older story. I have, I have stories from now, but I want to share them. <laughs> older stories. <laughs> I had scheduled a camp out with a group of wonderful youth leaders, but unfortunately, I double booked myself. And so in the middle of this youth camp out in Oklahoma, I left. I left this group of great youth leaders, but they were so sorely understaffed. Did not go well, did not endear me to them. And so when I got back, to her credit, the leader sat me down in the presence of my senior pastor and just laid into me. She said, I am doing everything I can right now to save this relationship, but I am so offended and so upset about what just happened this weekend. And it is so hard to sit in a room when someone starts listing your faults, especially when they're right. <laughs> you want to jump out the window. You want to counterattack. Oh, yeah, well, I don't like your hair or your attitude. You just want to, you want to say something. You just want to find some visible sin in their life that you can just criticize and deflect. I sat there and I took it and it was awful and I hated it and I said, I'm sorry, I will do better and we're still friends. We understand that when someone's offended, even if they can't translate offended into a particular feeling like sadness or confusion or anger, we know that they're hurt. We know that they're sad. We know that they're confused. We know that they're going through a season where faith is weak and it's worn out and we cannot react in those moments. We have to be gentle as a brain surgeon. You have to be so careful. Because when they react to you, one of the, one of the knee-jerk reactions is we're going to get on the defensive. And it's really sort of a misnomer that we say you're getting defensive because being defensive is really going on the offensive. It's counter-striking. It's invalidating. So when someone says, you know, well, you did this. Oh, yeah, well, you did this. And now I, they're offended and I'm offended that they're being offended. And now everybody's offended and we just go run and spread sunshine and joy everywhere we go. That's not what we're called to do. We're called to connect, and according to Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, we are called to be peacemakers. Jesus says blessed, which by the way doesn't just mean having good stuff in your life like a car and a house and food. Blessed means happy. It means content. It means things are at peace. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons and the daughters and the children of God. It does not say peacekeepers. Can nobody say anything? Everyone just keep this awkward tension going. Nobody upset anybody else. That's not what it's saying. Peacemakers, people who are willing to engage and do the hard work of being gracious and loving and kind and gentle. And it is hard work. Peacemakers need to be pacemakers because it doesn't happen real easy or real fast sometimes. But Jesus says, if you want to be a kingdom person, if you want to be a child of God, then your life is char characterized by how well you make peace, not how well you make war. Not, not how easily you can derail things and be divisive and be a hot mess. That is not a characteristic of, of a child of God. A child of God is somebody who is gracious, kind, gentle, does not ignore conflict, does not ignore sin, but seeks to deal with it in a peaceful, loving way, even when other people are a mess. It is hard work. We need Jesus to help us do it. And even when circumstances dictate we release others to their own offended and offensive existence, we are still called to care for them in the hope that one day God's grace and love will work a change to transform and set them free. So let's make peace and not war. Let's do our best to live above being offended and not take the bait. Let's strive to connect and not disconnect. And let us release others as Jesus releases us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming to this world, which is so broken and imperfect, full of so many bad attitudes and sins, and somehow you were able to endure it and sacrifice and love us in a way that restored our connection with you and each other. Jesus, we still struggle. Everyone in here, including myself, struggles with this. Release us from being offended and help us to have the strength 
and the faith and the love to seek to connect people with each other. Jesus, when we encounter those relationships that we cannot control, we cannot help, help us to release others, help us not to be manipulative and controlling. And when we do have to let those people go, help us to maintain an attitude of love and kindness towards them, not bitterness and anger. Give us the gift of repentance and forgiveness and help us to be peacemakers for you. In your precious name we pray, amen. Mm -hmm.